Let's start off by stating that there are a lot of different levels, aren't there? I can agree there. I mean, you have land levels, water levels, ice levels, lava levels, sand levels, forest levels, the list goes on. But we are not here to talk about any of those. As you can most likely tell from the title, we, the gaming family, are counting down our favorite sky or heaven levels in video games. But of course we have some rules to go down with first. Firstly, we have the obvious one for franchise rule. Secondly, for a level to count on the list, it either needs to be set in the sky, or on an object or platform in the sky, or just simply in heaven. Thirdly, the levels on this list are based on our own experiences and games we've played, so your favorites might not be included. Also, the order of this list was decided by a vote based on the participants' favorites and is thus just our opinion. I think that covers everything we need to explain. So, shall we get on with it list, guys? Because this is our top 17 favorite Sky Heaven levels in video games. Now I suggest we start this countdown now, don't you agree with me, Jamie? Let the countdown commence! For the seven people that are expecting top 10 flash games from me, one contender for being number one is this little game called Tower of Heaven. Now you're probably thinking, wait, this isn't a level. And you're right in that part. But cutting just a level of the game will be pretty damn short, if you ask me. Due to the fact that you can sprint around this game in less than 3 minutes, and thus making the experience kinda short. Oh man, does it deliver! The theme of heaven in this game is deeply symbolic and can be very subtle for people to miss out, and all complemented very nicely in the gameplay. Like, for example, the Book of Laws. Each law that you acquire in each level has a philosophical meaning while at the same time being implemented to the game to make it more challenging. And it's genius in its delivery. Oh, and by the way, the soundtrack is, dare I say it, freaking godly. Much so that you can buy it right now. Also, the game, you can play it right now. Seriously, I'll even leave you a link to play the game. Anymore. This is a game people should know about, though a bit simplistic and short, it has its extra content, like a speedrun mode and also a level creator if you want to experiment. So yeah, go ahead and play it. It would only take just a few minutes of your time. Unless... Really? Are you freaking serious? Come on! Unless you suck. Well, that settles it. I'm screwed. I went through about every single level from about every single game I own, and I haven't found one single sky level in it. I should have thought twice before participating in a list like this. Cursed by life, cursed by soul, cursed by logic, and most of all, cursed by lack of memory on almost everything and anything. I've officially hit the bottom of the barrel territory at this point. Oh, whoa. Uh. Of course! Of course! I used to play this a lot when it first came out. I mean, sure it was based on a Disney show that not a lot of people really cared about, but hey, that was a Disney show that had effort put into it. And the movie that was based on the show, Phineas and Ferb Across the Second Dimension, had a video game based on the movie for the PS3 and the Wii. I mean, surely something like this has to have at least one sky level in it. I mean, the show that it's based on has a lot of variety. Well, there's only one way to answer my question that you're all probably thinking that I'm thinking in my head right now. That didn't even make any sense, did it? Well, I just solved the answer to our prayers. 
let's talk about the Balloon Dimension. The Balloon Dimension is the second world that you travel to in this game. And I must say, for a game that's aimed towards mostly children, this is pretty enjoyable. As expected from the title of this world, there are upon millions of balloons scattered everywhere in this place. But surprisingly, that's what also makes this dimension a tad bit hard, because as you travel through these balloons, some enemies, which can be porcupines, will even pop the balloons that you're standing on in some cases. That way you can stay sharp and have quick reflexes to try and travel through certain parts of this dimension. This is a great sky level for certain purposes like that. It gives you something fresh and new to experience like most of the other dimensions in this game. This is also the dimension that gives you the Ninja Glove, which allows you to climb on walls, and when you upgrade it, allows you to shoot slime out of it to damage your enemies you encounter. However, this dimension has one single flaw, and it's the same flaw that all the other dimensions have in this game. It could be somewhat a little too easy. I guess I shouldn't be too cheesed off at that since of course this is a game for the little ones and it can't be too hard for them. But at the same time I wish this, as well as the other dimensions, were a tad bit more challenging. Other than that, it's a pretty good sense of wonder to experience for yourself. Especially since it has BALLOONS! You know you'll love this dimension for the balloons alone. Because you love balloons. And to everyone who says they don't, I'll have to send this guy over to your house to convince you to love balloons. I got a balloon for you! <laughs> don't you want a balloon? <laughs> Okay, for this entry, I was going to talk about the franchise that I talk all the time. Yes, Turnabout Airlines from Investigations, which is a good case, don't get me wrong, but it's not really a 100% sky level, since more than half of the stage is on the ground. So I have to go with a sky or heaven level, and it's from a genre that you wouldn't expect to have a said level be. Mount Olympus. <laughs> shit. Oh shit, it's recording. Uh, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go. The stage takes place, well, in Mount Olympus. And the plot goes that Caster gets tricked by Krios, who is disguised, and he's an evil bastard. Caster is sent to Mount Olympus, and the only way to get out is for Caster to fight his way through, like in any other linear scenario in the game. But it's nothing like that. Actually, there is nothing else like it. The gameplay mechanic that this level is based off can be summed by the game itself. Every step you take may change you, or something like that. Basically, the game is kind of bullshitting you on that regard, since the way you change is when you touch the statue. Well, you don't touch it, you walk over them, so the game is not completely bullshitting you actually. I was just fucking wrong. The thing is that this linear scenario actually makes you use a lot of strategy, like what to turn your soldiers to, who should stay back, how many healers you should have, or how many tanks you should have, and the way it's designed is really well done. It's not a masterpiece of game design, but it's a really fun level. It requires you to use all your units carefully. And when I mean units, I also mean the god powers you receive, and you can use whenever you want, like a boss. Now how the fuck I linked those two, it's a whole other issue that I should resolve. The hype, mystery, and reputation makes this place even better, and the outcome of all this was good character development for Caster due to him literally freeing the guys who want to eat the gods and destroy the world. Oh, and did I mention Kratos is not existent here, and they are stronger than the gods. So these won't work. Yeah, Titans in this game are no pushovers, and Caster released them from the depths of the underworld. Not the best feeling in the world, I'll tell you that much. And hell, you even fight your first one in the next stage. Yeah, I think someone needs antidepressants. All in all, this stage is one that really innovates the RTS genre. It's a really good level as well, and it showcases a lot of the creativity and effort that Age of Mythology and its expansions have. Definitely a stage for the ages. Like, holy shit, them graphics! Salatarobo Red the Hunter is one of the most beautiful games that I have ever seen that pushes the boundaries of hardware limits. Yes, you can get mad at me and say that this is fur fat crap, but you can just... Suck my dick. <laughs> but arguably one of the best and one of the most beautiful stages are the Davern Islands. Allow me to reiterate. HOLY SHIT THE GRAPHICS! I mean, just look at this beauty! The textures, the background, the islands, everything is just... just... Mm -hmm. Oh 
Okay, okay, calm down. Let me just explain a small bit of the story. When you first arrive on the islands, the main character, Red, his foster sister, Chocolat, as well as a mysterious boy named L, crash land after being attacked by a battleship being led by Opera Kranz, a member of the Kurva's special forces. But I'm not gonna spoil anything else, so let's just get to the stage itself. The Davern Islands are, well, floating islands. Simple enough to grasp. But the problem is that the islands are slightly far away, with no way to get there on foot. What do? Well, this is one of two stages where your robot, the Dahak, can enter flight mode, which is just so beautiful and makes the experience of exploring the islands much more satisfying. You need to use flight mode to get from one island to the other, all while keeping an eye on your boost meter. If it runs out, Red will plummet. There isn't a lot to do on the islands, sadly, but there are quests which involve the Air Robo GP minigame. In Air Robo GP, Red's Dahak gets a racing extension, which allows him to compete in races in the Davern Islands. There are also other quests that involve meeting the ultimate husband. <clears throat> I mean, meeting Waffle Rye Bread from Tail Concerto. And yes, that is his full name. But the Davern Islands aren't really that important plot wise. You just have a few sort of small areas to go through, and then you have a bunch of side quests, and that's pretty much it. Probably why it was so low on the list. But, I hope this is an incentive to buy Salatorobo. Please buy Salatorobo. Please. Oh ye, Stuffy. This underrated gem is hardly talked about, and it really should be talked about more often. I mean, it has great music, tech controls, it's pretty fun. So if you haven't played the game, you should. And you thought SS Logwater was my favorite world. This is Skyge Heights. So what makes Skyge Heights so creative? Despite being taking place in the sky, there is still water in there. Skyge Heights has multiple gimmicks that can be either a flop or a success. Flop! Here's this puffer cloud fish thing. And what you have to do is feed some clouds. This gimmick is boring. Thankfully, it's only done about twice or three times. But that's all the flaps, so pass! My favorite Bunsen power is used a lot here, and that is a Rooster. Rooster has some extremely broken attack, which is incredibly fun to spam. With this attack, Rooster can summon hidden platforms which are pretty obvious, and he can make specific enemies into platforms. And then there's a Huff and Puffin. The Huff and Puffin segments are extremely fun. Flying upwards in front of you otherwise couldn't get up, ha! That's a breeze! And not to mention it has my personal favorite boss fight in the game. And that's all. It may sound like a little, but trust me, this level has a lot to offer. If you haven't played Starfree, then go play it, like, now. This is by far my favorite sky level. At least it's not Babylon Garden. Say cheese spell and enjoy the view of my domain. Sky. A domain of the demon sorcerer of Sky, Shi Wu. Oh, good God! I did not want to see that! Despite there are plenty of Sky levels where this Sky demon would feel cozy, there is one place where he and his brethren Po Kong and possibly Cheng Zhu would never enter. What is this place, you may ask? How about a place which has their one weakness? musical instruments. It's not a land made of mayonnaise or horseradishes. I'm talking about Bandland from first Rayman game. Those who haven't played this game are probably wondering, how is this a sky level? Well, first off, this isn't just one level, but second world of the game. The levels of this world are so simply gorgeous, I can't separate them apart from each other. Second, Bandland is also a sky world. 
Sure, in almost every version of the game, the world begins on solid land, but Rayman gets higher and higher to the clouds when moving on. In Bandland, you travel through colorful environment made from instruments, clouds, sharp music notes and metal slides. Ironically, while this world is the second world in the game, many fans consider Bandland to be the hardest world in the game. One of the reasons being that first level, Bongo Hills, is the longest stage in the game and having frustrating 4th and 5th segments. Not only that, but thanks for being Skyward, falling to bottomless pit might be very easy on few parts. Bottom. <laughs> Hilarious. Specifically on second stage, Allegro Presto, where Rayman receives his famous helicopter hair ability. As for the locals of this world, oddly enough there isn't that much instrument residence. There's some very bugging enemies simply called moths, anti-tunes and hunters from other worlds of the game. Trumpets with strong flowing and sucking force, many lightning eyes, these are the red monster things, helpful giant monks and one pair of giant symbols. And who can forget the master of this world? The boss of this world is Mr. Sax, a giant walking saxophone who Melissa Simpson would stay away from for certain. Finally, as you can expect from a music world, the soundtrack in this world is simply said as beautiful as the world itself. That's what I was telling you before! <laughs> in short, Vantland is a perfect location for Green Scorpion's new condo. Oh, and also, with the challenge, beautiful environment and music, Bandland is easily one of the greatest sky levels in video game history. I believe I can fly! Everyone but me can fly. Before I even start this, let me say this. Never have I encountered a level with more cross referential than the Realm of the Almighty and Mighty from Dragon Quest IX. The player first arrives at this level after you break out of the Gittingham Empire prison together with the Conductor Sterling and your little Nelly Pop door. After you arrive at the observatory with the help of Sterling and the Starflight Express, Albus Major tells you that it would be wise to check up on the Almighty in his realm since the fallen Celestian Corvus was seen flying towards it earlier. And when you finally land in the realm, you're greeted by a clever interpretation of the classic view of what heaven looks like. The realm of the Almighty have a lot of fertile ground suspended in air, blooming with different plant life. The level is both beautiful to look at and to references to both classic Christian religious visions, items and interpretations, Greek mythology inspired figures, a combination of Norse mythic phenomenons and old witch lore, and finally some design inspired by the silver cities from Heroes of Minor Magic 5. That reference is too obscure. D you're too obscure. That is only because you never use me in your videos anymore, you jackass. I mean, would it kill you to actually write some more parts for me in your project? But as much as this is great in references, it is boring. Which is why I have put it together with the Realm of the Mighty. The Realm of the Mighty is the result of Kovos' influence on the Realm of the Almighty after he had returned. The once peaceful and beautiful view of the original realm have been twisted by desperation and hatred. You know, it is the Japanese translation of this level after all. The level shows a branchless and all dead tree with cores in the middle, symbolizing Kovos' view on humans as the complete opposite of Celestia's. The level also has some of the most powerful monsters in the game as it is the final level. 
This level not only references Lucifer's fall and attack on heaven through Corvus, but also references Barabas through the dragon Barbaros, and even throws in a reference to Chrono Trigger in the reusing of Goreham Hawk, Hootingham Go, and Gorespeed Paris as its version of Uzi Flea and Slash. These levels have great imagery, symbolism, challenges, placement in the story, and the final boss of the game. But despite all of that, they're uh, both introduced a little rushed in the story. Just like your comedic delivery.